have Sid. So it's definitely um, not to, one to miss out on Sid's knowledge. She's um, the local uh, geologist, eminent geologist, and spent over 40 years working as a geologist in industry, conservation, research, and education in Britain and overseas. And as a former field studies council, peripatetic geology and geography fieldwork tutor, an area earth scientist, um, the Countryside Council for Wales is a font of knowledge um, and has um, kindly supplied, um, say, supporting materials as well as the other speakers for the, the big rocky um, industrial quiz as well. And um, if Sid is happy and um, ready to go, I will stop sharing my screen and pass you over to Sid. Good morning, everybody. I'm just going to find my uh, screen to share with you. Can you see that okay, Alec? Yes. Can you hear me? That way, <clears throat> hear you and see the presentation. Great. Okay, so this presentation is a brief introduction to some of our resources in Pembrokeshire, geological resources. Most of the wor workings are historic, uh, so I mean they're not active. Uh, some of the sites are now popular tourist attractions. Most of the um, most of them are within sight of the Pembrokeshire Coast Path or inland walking routes. They're important still for educational purposes, fieldwork in geology, geography at all levels from primary to uh, university. They often feature in community history leaflets or websites. Some are used for um, outdoor activities. And there is currently an urgent need to make plans that involve going back to a more sustainable local supply of building materials and civil engineering needs. So, <clears throat> Tom's covered uh, some of this, but I would say here we're looking at uh, the park purposes enhance the natural beauty. Now, how much of those landscapes is actually entirely natural? Along the North Pembrokeshire coast, for example, there are very many uh, geological extraction sites. In the view of uh, the Preseli Hills, in the foreground, there are peat extraction workings, and up on the uh, Cum itself, uh, there is a slate working. So it doesn't matter where you go, you're going to be able to see um, examples of extraction. Uh, Thomas's maps were very good and show you how you can bring up all those sites. I just tried to label the map of the National Park. If I'd labeled everything, a bit like Thomas's maps, uh, it would have disappeared completely. The blue asterisks show the current workings, some of the main current working sites. The reason uh, there are so many sites is because the, there is fabulous uh, geodiversity in Pembrokeshire. So we're, we're very, very lucky in having such a wide variety of um, geolog geological features here. And again, a bit like uh, Thomas's slide, you can see that the utilization of these geological resources has uh, continued um, from the Stone Age to the present. So we're talking about flint and rhyolite um, arrowheads or stone axes in the Stone Age. Um, flints, not, not one of our... Um, <clears throat> We, we don't have chalk here, but um, there were flint um, working sites, say, for example, the Nab Head in St. Bride's Bay, and the chalk was the, the flints were brought in by ice sheets and were available to pick up. And then there's use of stone for um, monuments and a certain amount of uh, recycling of stone before um, sites became scheduled. And uh, the controversial one about um, the supply of the blue stones to Stonehenge. And again, glacial transport's probably involved there, but archaeologists won't like me saying that. 
and then coming through uh, not so much the resources for the Bronze Age, but certainly, you know, the metallic resources, not much copper to mix with tin, but um, <clears throat> certainly in terms of just general building materials like clum, clay, straw mixes, definitely got those resources. Um, <clears throat> looking here at St. Non's Chapel near St. David's and most of the stones there in, in St. Non's Chapel can be sourced to the local cliff top. Again at uh, St. Govan's, which was one of Thomas's examples, um, you can see how the limestone uh, layers and joints um, naturally provide blocky shapes which can then be um, shaped up a bit more to give you your building materials. St. David's, the old um, Bishop's Palace, you, the quarries were just um, a little way up the valley and then the more recent uh, cathedral used Tadbudi sandstone. You can see it here in its weathered and some recent replacements, uh, fresher looking stone and you can see it all around St. David's use of different geological resources. I think when we look at some of the <clears throat> outdoor activity sites, they are, they are, they have been heavily modified. I think that headland was probably a lot bigger um, before people quarried away the Kadabudi sandstone off that headland. Port Glyce is a very interesting site generally. We've got um, old quarries all around um, at the head of the inlet. <clears throat> and you've got um, this very interesting stone slabs here on the old Clapper Bridge. You've got the lime kilns and coming up a little bit more up to date, you've got coal was brought in and made um, into town gas for St. David's on the site there, which is now the car park. We can look back to Norman times when there was a huge developments of castles. This is Pembroke Castle in the walled town and the quarries all along the Pembroke River estuary here supplied a lot of that stone. Another um, well-known site, Aberaithi, uh, with its slate quarry, but um, there's also a lot of slate extraction on the south side of the bay in the past popular site now for outdoor activities. I'd just like to remind you when looking at uh, old sites like that, that um, uh, there's always an issue of potential instability. So be aware that the minimum safe distance from an unstable cliff is equivalent to its height. So you need to allow for catastrophic failure events uh, to be safe. Slate from Aberivy wasn't particularly quality. Most of it was probably used for walling uh, or slabs for uh, flooring, uh, but some of the better quality would have been used for roofing. Porthgain is another very important site. Changed a lot since um, the industrial usage going on till just after the Second World War. The First World War, I think, maybe. Um, <clears throat> you've got a slate quarry. That quarry also supplied um, clay for brick making. And then out on the coast, you've got the big uh, igneous rock quarry for the building stone and the aggregates. And all kinds of machinery, which is now um, not visible would have been used in those sites. For example, these, these um, pulley systems called Blondins, named after the person who tightrope worked across the uh, Niagara Falls. But a lot of the sites are now merging into the natural scenery, so they're quite hard to spot. I'm not sure if all of these show up on, um, <clears throat> on the nice um, websites that we've seen where we can look up slate quarries, for example. Millstones were another resource that were needed, water mills and windmills near the coast. And <clears throat> excuse me, around the um, around the coast, we've got a lot of uh, sites and then 
great concentration of sites in the Preseli Hills and over towards Trefgarn and particularly a large amount in the Dyclera estuary area. So there's the obvious things like uh, Rosebush Lake Quarry, but then there are a lot of other more subtle sites which are now blending into the scenery or have been backfilled, unfortunately. Slates were formed when the original mudstones or ashy mudstones were um, compressed and the slaty cleavage was formed. And we can see that uh, the, the rocks of North Pembrokeshire have been substantially compressed by the Caledonian orogeny when two continents collided around 400 million years ago. There's also sand and gravel resources in uh, North Pembrokeshire. This is Trevegan near Moyle Grove and Pantgwyn is in the same area. And they're working uh, the material that was released when the ice sheets that covered Pembrokeshire melted away, releasing large amounts of sand and gravel and mud. And those resources then need to be separated out into the constituent parts and then following that they can be um, made into concrete blocks for example. In terms of metalliferous minerals Pembrokeshire is not um, as well endowed as say Keredigian has uh, much more in the way of metalliferous minerals but there were some some extractions for example, here on the coast at um, Trieste, the this copper mine, uh, quite a dang potentially dangerous site. So uh, again, be careful if you're going to go somewhere like that. And then there was the mine at Dinas Mauer, the St Elvis, uh, mainly lead, but also some other minerals there, silver, small, small amounts of silver. The most important one was Llanvernach and there's full details if you want to look at that. Uh, some of those websites that Thomas mentioned might have the details. But also Peter Clorton's Industrial um, Mining Heritage website has information about places like that. Trefgarn Gorge, the southern end of Trefgarn Gorge has been very heavily exploited for particularly a roadstone in the past and a railway ballast and now the site is greening over again and I believe this is used by the old pond there, the flooded quarry is used by Sealyham for their active, some of their activities. Sealyham had its own slate quarry nearby as well. I see here that they uh, probably worked through part of a an archaeological site and then making that quarry. But you don't, I mean, that anywhere you go, there is something to see in terms of utilization of the local geological resources. So on Ramsey Island, they have plenty of loose stones, which were picked up and used for the walling. And then on uh, Skokholm, there was a specific quarry site here, which would produce um, material for walling and building. So it's the same, wherever you go, you will be able to find uh, localized extraction sites. On Coldy Island, although they had quite big quarries there as well, there was a lot of use of limestone in particular for walling and building. But um, unfortunately, a very large number of those old extraction sites are now let's use a polite word for it, backfilled. Um, they've been used as rubbish dumps, uh, which is a great shame really, because there's a lot of heritage there and we might need some of those sites in the future. So uh, just reminding you of the very different rock types that we have throughout the country, uh, county. Going up the Dyclethi estuary again, there's a lot of sites. This is West Williamston, uh, which is now a nature reserve, uh, but it was a very active quarry. With uh, barges coming in to take away the stone. 
and a little bit of my own history for example in the land shipping area some of my family were farmers and seasonal coal miners when there weren't any um, when there weren't any jobs to do on the farm they would be probably working in open cast workings rather in the mines and then there's the record of the terrible mining disaster there at Garden Pit. So we can see the coal field extending across from Kamalin Bay to St Brides Bay and uh, just a few of the mining sites marked as black spots here and um, that extraction of coal was going on from a very early stage. And it's anthracite, which is the best uh, quality coal, but it's only certain useful for certain purposes. It can't be used as house coal, for example. And then associated with the coal seams, there was iron ore usually occurring in nodules like these on the bottom right. There's the Travran Cliff Colliery near Newgale, another place where the workings went under the see and if you ever wondered why Ricketts head had such an unusual shape well that's simply because most of it's been mined away there were stone uh, quarries for building stone and there were quarries for uh, well, mines open cast mining in this area here has taken out all of what would have been the natural cliff profile that's looking down on the air, from the air to Ricketts head these are the open cast workings and this section here shows you all the different veins well not all of them in fact and you can see them marked on the map here as well there was a question as uh, where we can see those maps um, where you can get them you, you go to the british geological survey website and there's a maps portal and you can look at all of those online the typical coal seems quite thin um, so the hammer there is 35 centimeters so very difficult to work those underground and those coal seams uh, relate back to the carboniferous period approximately 300 million years ago when um, equatorial swamp vegetation provided the PC material which is later turned into coal. I already mentioned that peat was from the uh, Pacelli Hills was was cut and used as a fuel and then anthracite is at the other end of the scale in terms of uh, purity in terms of carbon content. Here's some examples of the nodular iron ore. This one, these are the actual nodules, and this one over here on the right is where they've been recycled into a conglomerate. So there was erosion at the time uh, in those swamps, and the ironstone nodules were concentrated into a better product. So, for example, uh, stretches of coast like uh, Wiseman's Bridge to Amroth were very heavily worked. Uh, for most most of these are actual quarry workings rather than landslides. I mean, there has been subsequent landsliding, but most of these scars here relate to the extraction of all these different coal seams and building stone in the term in terms of um, uh, just getting removing the the sandstone to get down to the coal seams but that sandstone was also a useful resource and in, in those times uh, it was mostly taken away by sea so sailing ships could come and just beach at high tide and then be loaded and float off again on the next tide but then subsequently uh, a lot of time was spent uh, with underground workings in the inland area for example the Grove Colliery near Getty and then a rail route to take that round to Saundersfoot Harbour uh, which we saw in Alex's introductory slide which was built in the 1840s primarily for the coal and iron ore exports. 
Now, sometimes the relics of those coal mining are much more subtle, the so-called bell pits, uh, where you just see on the surface today, you just see a little mound with a crater in the middle. That's, that's the remains of these very primitive workings for coal. And then they, uh, we're also down to the bottom right here, you can see the underground workings where they had pillar and stall type of working method very dangerous to um, go into those old underground workings. Saundersfoot area and Saundersfoot Harbour. Going here to Caldy, um, cliff uh, at the north end of the island, north northeast end of the island, very extensively quarried. Uh, quite primitive workings, you can see them with the sledgehammers and wheelbarrows. But later on, it, it did be, get a little bit more modernised. It's one of the first places where um, concrete blocks were made in Pembrokeshire. Stackpole Quay, another area of quite extensive quarrying of limestone behind the quay here. And the inland quarry area. And probably anywhere where it could be taken out. For example, in Middle Cove, this is probably quarried out. Things tending to blend into the uh, natural scenery by now, over a hundred years later for most of it. Although this quarry here was worked to the 1950s. There's the key area and the quarry behind the key. There's the inland quarry. Um, the workings were, you now most of the blocks were extracted just using iron bars to lever them out. Uh, black powder was expensive, so they would only use that as a last resort. Also, it tended to shatter the rocks rather than produce what you needed. But the workings there went on until the 50s, and here's the um, transformer that was used for the crusher. You can just see the remains of the crusher um, building. Some of those limestones were polished to make, um, it's not true marble, but a kind of black marble, sometimes with shells in it. I think uh, if you go on Wikipedia, you can find out almost anything these days. Don't try this at home. Also at Stackpole Key, they have a lime kiln and the lime, the unwanted limestone pieces were loaded into that and burnt or heated to a thousand degrees centigrade to produce quick lime, which was used for lime mortar before cement became more commonly used to bind together building stones and also for um, slaked lime to, to add to the fields to adjust the pH. Remember that the old quarry sites, this is um, Caled Quarry near Boscheston, can be extremely dangerous. Not just because of obvious hazards like uh, rockfall, instability of the old rock faces, but also the very cold groundwater is at 11 degrees C throughout the year. So if you, if you jump in there in a hot summer day, you're going to have a shock. Clay was extracted um, out on the Castle Martin Peninsula, the Flimston clay pits used to make clay pipes and um, ceramic goods. And then some of it was taken by this route here out onto um, the Devil's Cauldron and probably winched off onto ships on a very calm day, obviously winched off onto ships that might have been in this little natural harbour just here. Sand was extracted from all the dune systems. This is Freshwater West. Uh, you've got a very suspiciously flat area here which, where sand was probably extracted and up here alongside the road. West Angle, there were extensive uh, limestone quarries on both sides of the bay. And also uh, extraction of brick clay from just behind the, the beach today. That area is backfilled, but there is still the chimney 
uh, visible and some you can see the brick fragments in the in the cliff here at the back of the bay eroding out it's another area where there was massive extraction of sand and gravel at uh, mullet bridge at the back of the gan estuary something called the cane terrace here which i've arrowed which is when the valley was full of ice uh, there was a stream flowing along in a crevasse on the side of the ice which then deposited the sand and gravel uh, in an area which is now on the side of a hill. So it proves that there was ice occupying that valley. And then just coming on to the modern day, um, wherever you are in Pembrokeshire, you don't have to go very far to see some road surfacing. Most of it comes from Bolton Hill Quarry. Uh, to the top there is the Bolton Hill Quarry Complex with the old quarry and the new quarry being uh, worked on the top of the hill. And this is Garnwen in the Fraselli Hills, another source of roadstone. And this is St. Clair's Bypass. You can see where the roadstone gets used on big schemes like that. And you might um, commonly see various um, lorries of the local quarrying company transporting the products, the crushed stone, the cement, or the tarmac. And have a little quiz when you, or a little um, I spy when you go around looking for quarry lorries when you're driving, but pay attention to the road, obviously. Now, when those sites are abandoned, uh, they quickly, um, this is about, after only about five years, they, they quickly vegetate over and they have a huge uh, biodiversity because of these, these different habitats like ponds and bare rock faces and scree, all that kind of thing. They turned into wildlife parks without any uh, human intervention, any restoration they will become important biodiversity sites. Obviously, geology students want them to stay, uh, want to be able to see the rocks as well. So there has to be a certain amount of management. OK, well, um, that's a very brief introduction and I hope um, I'll get some questions now. Given everybody enough, um, <laughs> they know everything, don't they? Oh, there's those um, the excellent presentation. Did thank you. Um, wonder if people, uh, if any questions come to them later on, then we can um, fire them at you later on at the um, panelist question section. Yeah, I'll just say in terms of sustainability, we need to be possibly going back to a more local supply of building materials and items we need for civil engineering. One of the things we're going to need a lot of probably is um, materials for coastal engineering to uh, as sea level rises. So it's really time to start thinking about where where the resources are going to come from in a more sustainable way than we have been. We don't want to be importing things from India or China when we could be utilising our own resources. That's, yeah, that's definitely a... Yeah, there is a question that has come up actually of, um, on the Q&A. Uh, Robert's asked, why can't anthracite be used on house fires? <laughs> because it doesn't have any volatile. So uh, if you have house coal, you put the paper and the sticks underneath or you can use a fire lighter, but that provides heat, which drives off the methane gas, which is in the house coal. Anthracite doesn't have that methane gas. It's already been driven off. Um, some of it might be stored somewhere in the Irish Sea area, but um, yeah, so the house coal, the methane burning with the little blue flames that shoot up the chimney, uh, that is that is providing the heat to to get the whole fire going. 
So anthracite, you need you need a, a very strong draft, probably with an electrical fan in the, in the boiler system, rather than uh, rather than just in a house in a house fireplace, which we might not be able to use for much longer anyway. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sid. Um, there are some other questions that have popped up, but we will save those for um, the end of the event. Um, I'll we'll fire those at you then. Um, great. Thank you, Sid. So, as you say, thank you very much to Sid for um, great presentation.